are 196 nations in the world that are recognized by the United States, 196. One of them has been chosen by God. And that's the country of Israel. Deuteronomy 7, verse 6, the Bible says, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. God says that to one nation. It all started when God said to Abraham, Genesis 12, 2, I will make you into a great nation. And I will bless you. I'll bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And all of the peoples on the entire planet are going to be blessed through you, Abraham. And that is exactly what has happened. Through the line of Abraham, Jesus was born. Salvation came to the world. Through the line of Abraham, the Bible has been written. And the Bible has been preserved Every author of scripture, with the possible exception of Luke, is a Jew. My mentor, seminary advisor, Dr. David Larson, called the Jew, he says, the Jew is God's timepiece. If you want to know what God's up to, you just keep your eyes on Israel. For Israel is the key to history, it's the key to prophecy. Dr. Larson said, primarily, this is true because of Daniel chapter 9. Because Dr. Larson calls Daniel chapter 9 the backbone of biblical prophecy. So you picked a good Sunday to come to church. <laughs> you see, God intended right from the start, the nation of Israel was to be an object lesson to us. In Deuteronomy 6.6, 6, God said, Observe my laws, Israel, observe them carefully, for this will show your wisdom and understanding to all the other nations who will hear about all these decrees and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Did they keep God's laws? We know they didn't, right? Not even close. And because of that, Deuteronomy 28, it says, then the Lord will scatter you among the nations from one end of the earth to the other. You ever wonder why there's Jewish colonies in virtually every nation on earth? Because of this verse, God scattered them. Among those nations you will find no repose, no resting place. The Jewish people would never find rest wherever they went. If you've watched any movie about the Holocaust, you know. You know this is true. You have watched this with your own two eyes. And the fact is, it wasn't just the Nazis that hated the Jews. It wasn't the, and it wasn't the first time, it won't be the last. There have been 87 nations down through history that have driven the Jewish people from their borders. 87 nations. In the last century, we've seen a miracle happen. In Deuteronomy 30, verse 4, God promises to the Jews, he said, O Israel, even if you have been banished to the most distant land under the heavens, from there... The Lord your God will gather you and bring you back. Reminds me, when I was talking to one of the ladies at the hotel when we were checking in Israel the last trip, I just said, I always ask him, what's your story? Where are you from? She said, I'm from Uruguay. Uruguay. I had to think about it. Where in the world's Uruguay? Well, it's over there by Brazil, you know? I mean, that, that's the way. They're, everybody from Israel, they're all from different places, and they've come back. He will bring you to the land that belonged to your fathers, and you will take possession of it, and he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. And folks, we have seen this in the last century. Millions of Jews from every corner of the planet returning to Israel. 1948, the nation of Israel is reborn. Jesus said, now learn. He said, now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender, its leaves come out, you know that summer's near. Even so, when you see all of these things, you know that it is near. You know that it is right at the door. You see, the fig tree throughout the Bible is a symbol of Israel. Jesus cursed the fig tree in Matthew chapter 21. You know why? Because the nation of Israel rejected Jesus when he came the first time. So Jesus cursed the fig tree, but Jesus promised them the fig tree will bud again. 
In Daniel chapter 9, we have three distinct lessons that the nation of Israel teaches us. All of them are tied to a specific point in time, and we're going to study them as they unfold in this chapter. The first lesson is a plea for mercy. You ever needed to plea for mercy? Oh God, I am in a pickle. <laughs> and Lord, I need your help. And that's exactly where Daniel was in verse 1. It says, in the first year of Darius, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God. I pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting. Have you ever prayed like that? You prayed like that with sackcloth, ashes, fasting I prayed to the Lord my God and I confessed now Daniel was only a teenager when the prophet Jeremiah had made a stunning prophecy chapter 25 of Jeremiah Jeremiah said this whole country is going to become a desolate wasteland and th these nations will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years Jeremiah made this prophecy 605 BC 66 years later, fall of 539 B.C., Babylon falls to the Persians. Now in the first year of the reign of King Darius, Daniel's, he's not a teenager anymore, he's in his mid-80s. He's in his mid-80s. And he has his calculator out. The 70-year prophecy is about to end. Now, before we go any further, I want to point out that numbers are very important to God. After all, Daniel says in verse 2, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. How did he know that? From the scriptures. The Bible's full of numbers. There's even a book of the Bible named Numbers. So let's be clear. There is, there is a place for studying numerical patterns in the scriptures because they reveal to us the way that God works. You see, there is a double fulfillment of this prophecy. This is so exciting. <laughs> you can trace the people or you can trace the temple of Israel. How about the people of Israel? Okay, let's look at that first. Daniel was among the first group of exiles from Israel to be brought to Babylon, 605 B.C. 537 B.C., 68 years later, King Cyrus grants permission for the Israelites to return. The next year, 536, at the beginning of the 70th year of captivity, they began to return. Isn't that exciting? Now, the second fulfillment, you can trace the temple of Israel. The temple was destroyed in 586 because, you see, Nebuchadnezzar came three times to come against Jerusalem. And the first time, Daniel was among those who left. That was 605. The last time was in 586 B.C. And Nebuchadnezzar had just had it, and he destroyed the temple. But listen to this. In 516 B.C., exactly 70 years later, the new temple was completed and it was rededicated to the Lord does God keep his word now do you know why the Israelites were punished for 70 years you see way back in Leviticus 25 they had been commanded to rest the land every seventh year the Sabbath rest for the land by the way that's very healthy for the soil and a lot of farmers, you grew up in a farming background, you know you leave the, the fields fallow uh, certain periods of time because it rejuvenates them, it restores them, it revitalizes them. But Israel had stopped doing that. Around the time that the city of Shiloh was destroyed in 1094 B.C. Now, 2 Chronicles 36, 21 tells us this. So God... Because they wouldn't give the land a Sabbath rest, God says, I'm going to do it for you. And God spoke to the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 7, verse 14. He said, what I did to Shiloh, I destroyed them, I'm going to do to you.
because you disobeyed my commands. And again, we see how this is fulfilled with great precision. In the 490th year, after Shiloh was destroyed, it was 605 B.C., Babylon conquered Israel in that very year. Sure enough, the land of Israel sat idle for 70 years. One year for each of the Sabbath years they had neglected for 490 years. Is that exciting? Isn't that interesting? Now you may be thinking, you may be thinking, well, Pastor Denny, that's really cool stuff. But what's it got to do with me? So let me tell you what it has to do with you and me and everyone else. First, it tells us this book is precise. It, it tells us the Bible is precise. It tells us God's word should be taken literally. God says this is going to happen. By George, it's going to happen. We need to know that. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, basically he's saying, not the crossing of a T or the dotting of an I is going to disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. And anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same is going to be called least in the kingdom of heaven. You know, we like to say, don't sweat the small stuff. Jesus said, I want you to sweat the small stuff. Okay? I'm watching. Don't fudge the truth. Don't cheat on your taxes. Don't dabble with pornography. Don't flirt with someone who's not your spouse. In other words, don't play with fire. Just may end up getting burned. Israel, you see, is an object lesson to us. They thought, oh, you know, God's given us all these commands. It's no big deal if we, you know, if we miss one. Okay? We will plant our fields every year and instead of six out of seven years. They said, no big God will never notice. But he did notice. And finally, God said to them, if you won't give your fields a Sabbath rest, I'm going to do it for you. And he did that for 70 years. Now, let me interject here that the New Testament makes it very clear. Some of the Old Testament laws are no longer binding on us. The ceremonial laws, for instance, all of these festivals and feasts, they were fulfilled in Christ. The judicial laws pertaining to Israel, all the cleanliness laws, you've got to wash your hands this time and so forth, all of those were fulfilled in Christ. But the moral laws, the moral laws transfer. They're all reinforced in the New Testament. They're taught in the New Testament. They're binding on us. Now in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel is coming to grips with what has happened to his beloved people Israel. They have sinned before a holy God, and God wants them to come clean. No more excuses. No more explaining stuff away. No more saying that's no big deal. He wanted them to come clean. So in verses 4 to 19, Daniel pours out his heart to God. He confesses his sins. He confesses the sins of his people before God. And over and over again, Daniel takes full ownership for what he's done. In verse 7, he says, Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. Now notice, Daniel was basically a godly man. He is, he is asking the Lord's forgiveness for his land. Basically, he's saying, Lord, we deserved everything you did to us and more. We are guilty, guilty, guilty. Can I ask you today, do you confess your sins like that? If you're like me, sometimes it's hard to own up to it. There's sometimes when I go, what, me? <laughs> to, well, maybe. To go, I didn't really mean it. To, oh, Lord. Guilty as charged. 
You ever go through that? Only with great reluctance do I arrive at, oh God, I have sinned against you. I have grieved your heart. Oh Lord, have mercy on me. And that's where Daniel ends up in Daniel chapter 9. This chapter in Psalm 51, you want to read about confession? You want to understand how to confess your sins? You can read Daniel 9, Psalm 51, where David confesses his sin with Bathsheba. They're the best examples in all the Bible how to confess your sins before a holy God. In a nutshell, God wants us to come clean. What he's looking for more than anything else is humility. Verse 3 says he pleaded with God. And that's exactly what God wants us to do. In verse 18, Daniel says, We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. Let's move to the second lesson. Second lesson we can learn from the nation of Israel, Daniel chapter 9. The second lesson is this. The second lesson focuses on a person of hope. After 483 years of expectation, the prophets, the people of God, looked for their Messiah to come. I want to ask you today, are you looking for the Messiah to come? Because God is pleased with that. We are to eagerly await him. Are you looking for the Messiah to come to return to this earth? That's a good thing. It's, it's honored in Scripture. Verse 23, it says, As soon as you began to pray, an answer was given. Seventy-seven seventy-sevens are decreed for your people, your holy city, to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most ho holy. Now, I love it when it says, as soon as you began to pray, isn't it neat to know that God begins to move the moment we begin to pray? As soon as you began to pray, an answer was given. Isn't that beautiful? I am convinced that very little of spiritual significance happens apart from prayer. Pastor Jeff and I, we're praying all day long. We go into each other's office maybe a half dozen times a day, and we talk about something we're facing, and we say, you know what? We don't know what to do. We don't know what to do. But he knows. And so we bring it to prayer. Lord, help us to see this clearly. Help us to have your mind and heart Help us, cause us to do the right thing with regard to this matter. We need, to be, we need to be people of prayer. That's why the Bible commands us in everything, it says, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. When are we supposed to do this? We're supposed to do it in everything. It's nothing too small. That's why it's so important to never, ever give up in praying for things. You pray for everything. When our dog was sick, we prayed for the dog. Does dog, God care about a dog? I think he does. Created the dogs. You know? Our, our dog, uh, Izzy, was, she was dying, five years old. She lived another five years. Healed her. So... In everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. When are we supposed to do this? Everything. That's why it's important to never, never give up praying for things. Outwardly, it may look like nothing's happened. But if we could see, if the veil was pulled back, we would see things starting to move. Verse 24, it says, 77s are decreed for your people, your holy city. Who are Daniel's people? The Jewish people, the people of Israel. What holy city is he referring to? He's referring to Jerusalem. The holy city is mentioned more than 700 times in the Bible. Although this refers to Israel, it is to be an object lesson to us. 
490 years were set aside for Israel, the Jewish people, for six things to happen. The first three are negative. To finish transgression. To put an end to sin. To atone for wickedness. I believe those three prophecies referred primarily to the first coming of Christ. At the cross, Jesus dealt a decisive blow to sin. Jesus said, it is finished. All sinners can now find immediate, eternal forgiveness for all of their sins, past, present, and future. Those first three were fulfilled in, in the first coming of Christ. The last three are positive to bring in everlasting righteousness. Do we have everlasting righteousness right now? We don't, do we? We got a lot of sin in the world. Okay? But there is going to be a day when God's going to bring in everlasting righteousness to seal up vision and prophecy. Have all the visions and prophecies been fulfilled? No, they haven't. To anoint the most holy, you have to have a temple to anoint it. We don't have a temple right now. These three are about the future. They're about the second coming of Christ. They're about his return to the earth. He will usher in his millennial kingdom, a thousand-year reign of Christ. Jerusalem will be its capital. And if you're a believer, you're going to be there. So when is this going to happen? Now look at verse 25. It says, no one understand this. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, we know when that was. It was on March 5th. 444 B.C. Until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, when Jesus Christ entered on Palm Sunday, first time that he was acknowledged as the anointed one. Hosanna, they said. First time in the Bible where that took place. Publicly acknowledged as the Messiah. That date was March 30th, 33 A.D. The Bible says from March 5th, 444 B.C. to March 30th, 33 A.D., there will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. That adds up to 69 sevens or 483 years. The book of Daniel and, Bo and the book of Revelation both use, they both calculate a year as 360 days, which was the most common way of reckoning time in the ancient world. Now, it is interesting that this time span from the decree of Artaxerxes rebuild Jerusalem, to Palm Sunday entry of Jesus into Jerusalem is exactly 173,880 days. It is exactly 483 years if you use 360-day years. Now, I don't know about you. I find that impressive. In fact, I can remember sitting in my seminary classroom at Trinity on the north side of Chicago, I can virtually remember where I was sitting in that classroom as Dr. S. Lewis Johnson was walking us through this passage of scripture and the whole class sat there stunned. Sir Robert Anderson, a detective at Scotland Yard, was the first scholar to connect the dots of that prophecy. Dr. Harold Honer of Dallas Theological Seminary revised it by one year because it had become increasingly clear that Jesus was crucified in 33 A.D., not 32 A.D., as Sir Robert Anderson had thought. <clears throat> now let's just stop for a moment and think about this. And again, I ask the question, why is this important to us? Most of us are Gentiles, not Jews. So once again, let me remind you, Israel, the Jewish people, they're an object lesson for us. God wants us to look for the coming of the Messiah with great expectation, just like they did. The Bible says in 1 Peter 1.10, this is talking now about the first coming of Christ, it says, concerning this salvation, the prophets searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find the time. Are there people looking for the time of Jesus' arrival today? Yes, there are. And the circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. They were looking for signs of the first return of Christ. And then 1 Peter 1.10 says, Even angels longed to look into these things. See, when Jesus came the first time, there was messianic fever 
in the air. And that's what drove the Magi, the wise men, from their homes in Persia all of the way to Jerusalem so they could see the newborn Messiah. The Magi were brilliant men. They studied under the Jewish prophets, including the writings of Daniel. The Magi. Where is Daniel writing this from? <laughs> Probably writing it from Babylon, but now the Persians have conquered the Babylonians, right? Where did the Magi come from? Most likely Persia. They studied these writings, and you know what? They did the math. 483 years after their own Persian ruler, Artaxerxes, issued his command to rebuild Jerusalem, they knew the Anointed One was coming. So they did the math. And I think they were looking for the star before the star got there. And when the star got there, they dropped everything, and they, they traveled about a thousand miles to see the baby who was destined to be the King of Kings. Isn't that exciting? You see, that's the same zeal God wants us to have. You go to Philippians 3.20, it says, God wants us to eagerly await the return of our Messiah. When Jesus returns, he wants to see us on our tiptoes, ready to meet him. Now that brings us to the third lesson we can learn from the Israelites. Third lesson looks ahead to the promise of glory. The day when all the wrongs will be made right. Unfortunately, there would be seven years of tribulation before that happens. And that's what the third lesson is all about. Look at verse 26. After the 62 sevens and the seven sevens, that's 483 years, after that takes place, the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. Who is the anointed one? It's Jesus. He was crucified. Everyone abandoned him. And you know what? He was flat broke when he died. They even auctioned off his clothes. You know? He had nothing. So he had nothing. He was cut off. He had nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. This refers to another ruler who will come after Jesus. We know that the Antichrist will arise out of the Roman Empire because of this verse. It was the Romans who destroyed Jerusalem 70 AD and completely leveled the temple so that a, not a single stone sat upon another. So we flash forward from 70 AD all the way to our present age because it refers to the end times. It says, the end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end. And desolations have been decrees. Do we see a lot of wars today? Do we see a lot of desolations, a lot of unusual times of upheaval? Jesus predicted this in Matthew chapter 24. Now verse 27, it says, He, the Antichrist, will confirm a covenant with many, the Israelites, for one seven, this is the last seven of the 77s that were prophesied. 483 has been fulfilled. There's seven yet to go. In the middle of the seven, the Antichrist will make a treaty with Israel that will start the seven years. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. He's going to commit a sacrilege in the temple. On a wing of the temple, he'll set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. The Antichrist is going down. He's going down. So right in the middle of this seven-year treaty with Israel, the Antichrist is going to commit a great sacrilege in the newly rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. So <laughs> the temple has to be there. And the moment he does this, the moment he commits this sacrilege, the clock begins ticking. 1,260 days remain, three and a half years. And Jesus warns there will be great distress unequaled from the beginning of the world until now. Jesus points to Daniel's prophecy as the seminal event that unleashes hell on earth, his wrath on earth. 
Now that's the bad news. The good news is this. God's going to use that time of intense suffering and he's going to drive the Jewish people to himself. In large numbers. We see the Jews starting to come to Jesus today in larger numbers, but they will come in masses at that time. Now here's what happens next. The prophet Zechariah, chapter 14, assures us that God is going to take this faithful remnant of Jews, he's going to make them the centerpiece of his thousand-year millennial reign, and if you're a believer, you're going to be there. And it's going to be a wonderful time on this earth because the Bible says the lion will lie down with the lamb. I close with this. It's also another piece of good news. It's really good news for us, the church of Jesus Christ that he calls his bride. Because you see, we're going to be taken out of this world before the seven-year period of tribulation begins. Is that good news? How do we know this? Three reasons. The seven years of tribulation is for Israel, not us. If you look back on verse 24, it says, 77s are decreed for who? For your people. That's Israel. That's the Jews. The tribulation period is intended for them. God has business to do with them. The second reason we know that we will exit before that time is because God has promised us, his church, to protect us from his wrath. Not to protect us from tribulation and suffering. We will have this, but not his wrath that is going to be poured out during the tribulation period. God promises his church in Revelation 3.10, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world. And then the third reason we believe that we will be exiting before the tribulation period begins is because we are repeatedly taught to expect our Lord's return at any moment. Any moment. Even Paul thought Jesus would return in his lifetime. But hold it a second. The tribulation period hadn't happened yet. You see? Those two are not linked together, the rapture and the tribulation period. So in 1 Thessalonians 4.17, Paul says, we who are alive, he was expecting to be alive, and remain will be caught up into the clouds. He taught us to always be ready to meet our Lord, even in times of peace and prosperity. This means the rapture may happen before there's any hint of the tribulation period. So the question I want to leave with you today is, are you ready to meet the Lord if he should return in the next five minutes? Are you ready to meet him? Even here, we can learn from Israel and the Jewish prophets because they studied the scriptures diligently so they could be ready for whatever God was doing. And folks, this is especially important in light of what is happening in the Middle East right now. You see, God is moving all of the major players around. He's moving them like chess pieces on the chessboard. The last decade has been a decade of great turmoil for the nations that comprised what was the Roman Empire, mostly in Europe. Europe's been in turmoil the last decade. You know why? Because the wars in Syria and Iraq and unrest in other Islamic nations have led to this great influx of refugees throughout the Mediterranean Sea. And where have they gone? Primarily they've gone to Europe and it has caused tremendous instability. More than ever before, Europe is looking for stability. The Antichrist, I believe, will arise and up out of the European nations. He could very well be alive right now. He could be climbing the ladder of influence 
in a prominent European country, which is all the more reason to say to you today, are you ready when the Messiah returns? Are you ready if it should happen before this sermon is over? Are you ready? Let's bow our heads in prayer. As our heads are bowed, throughout the Bible, God teaches us the brevity of life and the uncertainty of life. And the Bible teaches us that there are two things that no human being knows. The first is we do not know the time of our death. It could happen at any moment. We know there are people around us that have dropped from a heart attack without any previous signs of that. They've just dropped. And their, their life is over. The other thing we don't know is when Christ will return. We don't know. So we need to always be ready. That's why the Bible says today is the day of salvation. We don't know if we're going to have it tomorrow. We make all kinds of plans. If you're like me, you've got lots of plans. we got plans to go to Israel. But we don't know if we'll ever make it there. Because God might have other plans. You see, we make our plans. But he makes the real plans. Are you ready to meet him? As our heads are bowed right now, I just want to encourage you to turn to the Lord. And you can do this silently in prayer right now. And you can say what the, what the thief on the cross said to Jesus. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now the thief was already very well aware of his sin. He wasn't like the other thief that mocked Jesus. He was grappling. He said, we deserve to be here. He had acknowledged his sin. So you can do that today. You can just come to the Lord and you can just say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I, I have broken, broken your commands. I own up to that, Lord. And I need a Savior. I need a Savior. Will you be that Savior? Will you cleanse my sins? Will you make me a new person? I want to be born again. I want to live for you. You can just tell the Lord that right now. And then go out there and do it. Just as Jeff Pribble was saying just a few moments ago, join. Join a group of godly people face to face so that you're wrestling with the issues of life in the context of a Christian community. If you're not in that, that's your first step. That's your first step. Lord, I thank you for those who are stepping out right now. And they're saying, Lord, I believe. Lord, I want you to be my Savior. I want you to wash away my sins. I want to be ready if I should drop dead, as hard as that is to think about. At any moment, I want to be ready. I want to know. I want to have that security. If you should come today, if you should come today, I want to know that I will be in that number that rise to meet you in the air. Oh, Lord, that is my prayer. We ask this in Jesus' name.